History of the Captivity of Napoleon in St. Helena. Chapter 1, the Elysee of Bourbon. The emperor has been made to say, I have not found any true fidelity except in the old noblesse. Twice have events brought me near his person when he had just abdicated the throne at Fontainebleau on the 19th of April when I hastened to offer to carry him off on his way to the mountains of Terrar with the troops under my command on the upper Loire and to conduct him into the midst of 80,000 men belonging to the armies of Marshals Augereau, Suchet, and Sewell. I found no one in those vast corridors, formerly too small for the crowd of courtiers, except the Duke of Bassano and the aides de camp, Bussy and Montesquieu, the whole court, all his personal attendants, even Constant, his valet de chambre, and Rustem, the Mameluke, had forsaken their unfortunate master and hastened towards Paris in hopes of finding places about the court or in the household of the new master, whom the defection of the Senate had just given to France. At the Elysee, on the 21st of June, 1815, I found no one in attendance except Council's causes and Montalembert, whom I had never seen there in the prosperous days of the empire, although their names had been on the list of imperial chamberlains since 1809, and Baron Montserrat, an equerry, the aides de camp Jouet, Flau, La Baudoyere, De Chien, Carvino, were either in the chamber of peers or at the head of troops, as these periods of terrible recollections of people, considered as a whole, remained faithful to the ruler of their choice, but among the other classes of the nation, fidelity was the exception. On the 21st, at half past six in the morning, the emperor arrived at the Elysee Bourbon. The state of Paris made him uneasy. The city was the resort of his most dangerous enemies, of those whose active minds and interested intrigues could do him most mischief. The others, Prussians and English, required a considerable time to accomplish the distance. Eight or ten days' march must be spent in coming from Waterloo to Paris, and during these eight or ten days, the emperor could do much. It was from Paris in 1813 that he rushed to the aid of the shattered remains of the army of Russia at the head of 300,000 men, with whom he gained the battles of Lutzen and Bautzen. Paris was a grand center of action from which he could most effectually counteract a foreign invasion, provided Paris was disposed to sustain him. Paris was finally the heart of France and Bonaparte wished to judge of the spirit of the nation by placing his hand, as it were, on the pulsations of its heart. These pulsations were rapid and feverish. The two chambers were convoked. The two assemblies communicated their deliberations to each other. Beyond the pale of their meaning, the people collected in crowds, which were continually augmenting, and those low murmurings began to be heard, which are always the preludes of a political tempest. The Chamber of Deputies was at the same time afraid of being either dissolved by the emperor or dispersed by the people. General Lafayette led them to adopt a decision and caused it to be proclaimed that every man should be regarded as a traitor to the country who should make any attempt with a view to dissolve the chamber. This was the first inroad upon the imperial authority, this decision having been adopted and the chamber thus protected against Napoleon. It next became necessary to guard itself against the people. A second resolution was adopted. Lieutenant General Count Becker, member of the Chamber of Deputies and filling the office of Questor, was nominated commandant of the guard appointed to watch over the safety of the legislative body. The chamber, reassured by these two measures, continued its deliberations. During this time, Napoleon's first care on arriving at the Elysee had been to convoke there the ministers and great dignitaries of state in order to ascertain the state of popular feeling and the amount of defection produced in the chambers by the tidings of the calamity of Waterloo. Should the emperor in person present himself to the chamber of deputies, even whilst he was covered with the dust of the battlefield, and make an appeal to the patriotism of the representatives of France, or satisfy himself with sending his brothers, 
or the minister to explain and his name, the evils of the country. The ministers were summoned for seven o'clock. When they arrived, they found the emperor's carriage in waiting and ready to convey him to the Palais Bourbon. The reading of the ministers supported with all the power the proposal of a personal communication. These were Cabeceres, High Chancellor, and Minister of Justice, General Carno, Minister of the Interior, Duke of Bassano, Minister Secretary of State. The majority of the council was, however, of a different opinion. In their opinion, the emperor ought not to expose himself to the storms of a sitting in which all the passions of the members would be arrayed against him and their violence justified by the pretext of the imminence of the danger and the vast extent of the sacrifices which the circumstances demanded. The emperor yielded. Had Napoleon listened to the advice of his brother Joseph, Fouché would have been conveyed from the council to Vincent as a traitor, and the empire which this man destroyed might perhaps have been saved. Lucien and Joseph had both been in Paris since the month of April. They expected to have been able to resume or the veterans of the Republic that influence which had twice obtained for them the presidency of the legislative councils. But this expectation proved fallacious. In vain did Prince Joseph in the House of Peers and Prince Lucien in that of deputies attempt to revive those sympathies which had been extinguished or repressed. By recent events, their political principles had undoubtedly secured them numerous and faithful friends among the ranks of the liberals, and they would have combated with success the efforts of that party, which was eager for the fall of Napoleon at any cost, had the emperor, instead of returning to Paris, remained at the head of his army, and though conquered, still maintained threatening attitude. The chamber, which would perhaps have yielded to the majesty of the emperor, became bold in his absence and whispered the word abdication. It then passed a decree that a commission should be named consisting of deputies and peers who should assist the ministers and cooperate with them in adopting measures to save the country. The deliberations of this united council were prolonged far into the night. The question of abdication was discussed, and when Napoleon awoke in the morning, the result was submitted for his immediate acceptance. Inexplicable caprice of fortune, which only three months before had followed, as it were, from the Gulf of Juan to Paris. The flight of that eagle, which flew from belfry to belfry to the very towers of Notre Dame. And that, too, in the midst of the acclamations and the shouts of triumph of a whole great people on this occasion, he was neither in immediately contact with the army nor with the masses. The electric chain was broken June 22nd, early. The Council of Ministers was convoked at the Elysee. One would have supposed that the whole of them would, from conviction, have rejected the idea of any chance of safety for France in an abdication which would deprive the country of the resources of Napoleon's genius. All, oh, however, with the exception of Cambuceres, Carnot, and the Duke of Bassano, voted in favor of the necessity of this great sacrifice and assured him that it would specially facilitate the conclusion of the peace to which he was the only obstacle.